Um, so uh, I've been, uh, I'm taking the summer off writing a book about uh, uh, consciousness in the brain, and uh, uh, this is kind of what, what the book is oriented on. And I gave Gautam uh, three titles, uh, all of which are potential candidates for the book title, and he picked this one because it's the safest. Now, the one I prefer is this one, Tuning the Brain, How Neuroscience Got It Wrong and Quantum Vibrations Make You Feel All Right. And uh, he said, no, the neuroscientists won't come. They'll be offended, but you're here anyway already. So uh, I think neuroscience got it wrong, has gotten it wrong in terms of understanding how the brain produces consciousness in a lot of, a lot of things. I mean, obviously, we know an enormous amount of details. We know a lot. But how does, how does the brain really work? I don't think we really know. So uh, part of the, the, uh, the dogma of, uh, of how the brain works comes from, or is summarized in a paper by Crick and Koch, in 2003, a framework for consciousness. And this kind of, uh, you know, consciousness had been kind of buried, uh, wasn't really talked about. And uh, Crick and some other prominent people, Penrose Edelman, came out in the late 1980s and started talking about consciousness. And uh, anyway, uh, Crick teamed up with Christoph Koch, uh, a, a, a very notable neuroscientist, and they came up with a framework for consciousness. Kind of set the, the, uh, the, the frame or the stage for what we should be looking for in terms of understanding consciousness. And they gave ten rules, kind of like the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm being, uh, I'm joking, obviously. But um, the, the the major point they made was that the cortex is the primary site of consciousness, which is probably true. The front, look, the front of the brain looks at the back of the brain, which is also sort of true. We have zombie modes of non-conscious autopilot activities that go on without us being conscious, which is true. Consciousness is, involves coalitions or assemblies of neurons, which is basically true. It goes back to Hebbian assemblies. Uh, there are explicit representations, for example, in V1. I think that's true. Uh, higher levels get activated first, and then consciousness happens later, and that's probably also true. There's modulation of firings, which is probably true, although I don't think firings are what mediate consciousness, and I'll get to that point. Snapshot moments, that is, consciousness is a sequence of discrete events, and I think that's true, and that's probably the most <coughs> profound thing that, that came out of this, because everything else is kind of already known. Uh, there's a, a tension and binding are problems, and there's a penumbra of non-conscious that kind of tied it to William James and so forth. But always talking about, about firings. Now, since that time, since uh, uh, Francis Crick passed away, uh, Christoph has uh, aligned himself with Giulio Tononi, so I'd add three more commandments, if you will, that, that consciousness involves integration uh, of, of information and, com and f complexity that phi uh, terms... Um, uh, the Tononi terms phi, complexity, and, and lately uh, Christoph has resorted to panpsychism. I think he realized that the computational approach uh, didn't work and explain consciousness and now becomes somewhat of a panpsychist in his recent book, uh, uh, Confessions of a Romantic uh, Reductionist. I'm not picking on Christoph, I like him a lot. I just think he's, he kind of symbolizes where we've gone and he is one of the leaders and I think, um, I think we're, we're missing the boat. I think we're barking up a lot of, a lot of wrong trees. Okay, so the dogma as it stands, if you distill all that and, and, and take where we are now, I think uh, this is probably what, what people talk about or is taught. Everything's based on the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, that it's integrate, integrate and fire. So inputs integrate to a threshold, then fire. And people look at the firings, the spikes, and their synaptic transmissions as fundamental information bits. Despite the fact that local field potentials in EEG come from dendrites and soma, not from spikes. And, and local field, EEG is the best marker we have of correlates, uh, correlate of consciousness, despite the fact that, that the emphasis is on spikes, because they're easy to measure. You can put them on, on sound and you hear that kind of stuff, and it's really cool. But consciousness may have, may have already happened by the time the neuron fires. I think it happens, in de which I'll get to, in the dendrites and soma. Um, everything is based on the neuronal surface membrane potentials, uh, mediating signaling. Uh, uh, gated, graded potentials on the, on the uh, in dendrites and soma, and the all or none action potential. EPSPs, IPSPs, and spikes. That is everything in terms of information processing, in terms of real, real time cognition and con consciousness in the, in, the, in the dogma. Psychoactive drugs, anything that affects the brain, mood, consciousness, act exclusively at postsynaptic membrane receptors or channels. 5-HT, GABA receptors, dopamine, opiate, NMDA, et cetera, et cetera. Everything, all the drug studies are aimed at, at what receptor is being activated. 
and I, don't, I, think that, I think they do bind to receptors, but they also bind inside the cell, and I'll, as I'll show you. And that the neuronal interior, including the micro, cytoskeletal microtubules, provide only structural logistical support. Uh, they're, they're skeletal structures and, the, and transport structures. Okay, so that's kind of the summary of the dogma that we, where we are right now. Now, what does this not explain? What neuroscience dogma cannot explain? Well, consciousness, awareness, phenomenal experience, the hard problem. Okay, maybe I'm being picky because you can say, well, nobody can explain that. Maybe that but I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. I think that, you know, barking up the wrong tree, for sure we can't explain it. Memory. Uh, synaptic plasticity supposedly mediates memory, but membrane proteins which mediate synaptic plasticity are transient, hours to days, and they're gone. They're recycled. Yet memories can last lifetimes. Uh, Real-time conscious control as measurable brain activity correlating with consciousness apparently occurs too, too late. So we uh, must be epiphenomenal and illusory, and I think uh, that's not necessarily true. Uh, Single-cell organisms with no synapses, just one organism, swim, learn, and have sex without synaptic con connections using their microtubules. If a paramecium is that clever, are neurons just you know, on-off states, one or zero? Uh, mechanism of action for anesthetics and psychoactive drugs. Is, uh, you know, people say this receptor, that receptor, but we don't really know. Treatments for Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injury, etc. We don't really have any good treatments. Every, every paper comes out and says this is going to help treat Alzheimer's, and of course they never do. Uh, and the possibility for non-locality, near-death experience, out-of-body experience, telepathy, these things are just say, no, that's impossible because the brain is a computer, blah, blah, blah. Well, how do we really know? There's certainly a lot of reports and uh, this sort of thing of consciousness uh, leaving the body. And uh, the same, you know, I, I don't... Um, I don't claim any proof of any of this, but there's certainly a lot of reports. And the only reason we say it's impossible is because we have this dogmatic approach to the brain, which doesn't really explain anything uh, important that I can tell, important in terms of consciousness. Uh, so we can't really say that there aren't these experiences. Okay, so the basis for the dogma is based on the, uh, on the integrate and fire uh, Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, where inputs come into dendrites and soma, the cell body, uh, from all these synapses all over here. Uh, it's integrated to a threshold, which when threshold is meet, uh, fires. And, and the signaling is by ion ch ions traversing, causing signals along. And then that goes all or none, all the way to the next layer of synapses, with about an 85% uh, probability of releasing uh, neurotransmitters <coughs> to the next, next synapse. So integrate, fire, integrate, fire, integrate, fire. Uh, that's the basic model that we have for Hodgkin-Huxley neurons. If you put all these together, and you have the brain as a computer. If you take enough integrate and fire neurons, put them together, uh, you can make a computer out of something that looks like a computational system. And that's the model. That's what everybody's bought into. The brain is a computer. Neurons, uh, firings are bits. Integrate and fire neurons. However, uh, a, couple, a couple problems. Number one, uh, neurons aren't really Hodgkin-Huxley uh, integrate and fire neurons completely. So, um, for example, here's a mod, this is from a paper by Nondorf et al. in 2006 in Nature, where here is uh, what would be predicted uh, by the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron with the red being spikes and the gray being activity in the soma and dendrites. And basically, when it reaches a, a threshold about here, uh, there's a very narrow uh, threshold and the spikes uh, occur at, at, at an angle. And the reason is supposedly that... Um, that they have to propagate along these ion channels in the axon initiation segment. That's why, the, that's why they're slanted. And, but there's a very narrow threshold. So when you reach the threshold, you fire, and that's a 1 as opposed to a 0. That's, that's what uh, Hodgkin-Huxley behavior is predicted to be. However, uh, Nondorf et al. put electrodes in, in uh, cortical neurons in awake animals, and what they found was, was, was different. What they found was that the threshold was, was quite variable and also upright. So all the spikes happened, you know, vertically at the same time, which means that these ion channels must have opened simultaneously, some kind of coherent opening. That's for the verticality. But most significantly, we have this very wide variability. Something other than the membrane potential is, is triggering the neuron to spike. There's some X factor. Yeah? What's on the Y axis? Uh, voltage, I think. Yeah, microvolts. These are the spikes, and this is the uh, EPSP, IPSPs. It's, it's the time on the, on the bottom, right? Uh, this is memory potential. Mm 
Yeah. That's a good question. I'm not, I, I'm not sure, actually. With the, with the grouping of the vertical lines, that, that corresponds to um, co-temporal firing. Is that what you're saying of a bunch of it, it happens at, at different voltages. It can happen down here at uh, whatever that is, 60. It can happen at 54. And, and it, it varies from spike to spike. That was the, the point of the paper. There's some additional factor, in addition to memory potential, that triggers a spike or not. Something coming from where? From, I would say, inside the neuron that doesn't, doesn't show in the memory potential. So at a given memory potential, the neuron should fire. This shows that at a given memory potential, it may or may not fire, depending on some other factor. There's a lot more variability. And they, and they also did it in slice, and they did it in simulation, and they didn't see this variability. So it had something to do with this neuron being in an awake animal. So, so the Y would then be counts? Uh, it might be I think, yeah, these are individual spikes. Uh, yeah, that's. I, I'm not sure actually. There's the pay. We can we can look it up, or I can look it up. Can I ask you that? What, what did you? What are you referring to when you said those channels opened at the same time? Well, um, the the Hodgkin Huxley. The reason these are supposed to be, it's slanted is that this opens and this opens and this opens and this opens. So it's a, it's gradual. But what actually happens is, it looks like they're all opening, or a bunch of them are opening at the same time. Some kind of quantum coherence. Maybe, which has been which has been suggested for that. All right. So what, there's some additional factor. So if we put in a schematic, basically what it says, if we have integration over time uh, versus memory potential, there's a very narrow temporal window and a very narrow voltage window for uh, firing. But what is actually observed is that there's a very wide temporal variability and a very wide voltage variability that influences when this firing, and what I'm suggesting is this is where consciousness comes in. When I say bing, that supposedly means consciousness. So this, is the, this would be the strategic place for consciousness to come in and affect firing. Otherwise, we're in a deterministic loop, everything is algorithmic, and well, besides no free will, there's, there's no, we'd be automata. But if there's variability, this is where it would come in and strategically and logically exert, uh, affect behavior and activity uh, by altering the threshold from, in, from, from somewhere. I'm saying inside the cell. Okay, so a couple of uh, uh, preliminary conclusions. Consciousness occurs in end integration, and with that I, I agree with Tononi, except then they bring in spikes, which integration has already happened. Consciousness causes deviation in Hodgkin-Huxley neuronal behavior. I think that's where we should be looking for consciousness. Where and how. Okay. So let's just consider uh, sensory uh, um, uh, inputs, uh, which uh, go uh, visual or whatever, go to thalamus. And we know that there's basically three waves of activity, for, at least for visual, um, visual consciousness. The first wave, primary, goes to V1, uh, as, as Culkin, Chris, uh, Crick and Koch said, which is not conscious, but may have a, a representation. And then there's a, uh, a secondary wave, uh, feedback, which goes to the front of the front of the brain, prefrontal cortex, or some other area, and then there's a third wave that goes from there somewhere else, various places, and that's conscious. Uh, we know that from from a number of, of types of studies. So in philosophy, this is similar to the higher order thought theory, Rosenthal and Genera, that you need some kind of executive cortex feeding back to cause consciousness to happen. Now, we were just talking earlier about that uh, study by Ralphie Malik where they watched the movie and there wasn't any, any frontal activity. It was all uh, back. So this is, uh, this is for this particular type of consciousness. It, maybe you don't need this for everything, but for this particular uh, uh, form, it seems to work. Another reason it seems to work is that um, this third way of frontal parietal feedback uh, well, Victor Lame has uh, done. He he's the one who suggested it's the uh, the recurrence or the. Uh, I'm sorry. This is feed forward, and then this is feedback. So the feedback, uh, feed forward is not conscious. The feedback or the third wave is what correlates with consciousness, and that's what uh, Victor Lame and others have said. Now, also uh, George Mashur, who spoke at the Tucson conference, uh, did an, a very interesting study. It turns out that all anesthetics, whether it's gas anesthetics, ketamine, propofol, the three basic types, the gases, propofol, and ketamine, all act only on this third wave. 
It, it doesn't affect this. We can nicely vote potentials under anesthesia. It doesn't affect uh, the feedback, the f feed forward. It does inhibit this feedback, this third wave. And why that is is really strange because the, the, the neurotransmitters, the receptors, are all, they're all the same for all three waves. But something specific about the third wave that seems to be uh, relevant to consciousness. So <clears throat> the third wave, what happens when it, when it gets to cortex? And there's, a, there's also three waves. Um, the, the primary inputs come to layer four. And they travel along layer four. And layer four sends inputs. This is supposed to be green, yellow, and red. It kind of looks the same. From four goes to one, two, and six. One, two, and six. And then from one, two, and six, we get this third wave that goes to the pyramidal neurons in layer five. The giant pyramidal neurons in layer five, whose apical dendrites go to the uh, cortical surface and give rise to EEG. So we have this third wave also at the level of cortex. And this seems to be where consciousness is, like, is most likely to happen. I'm not saying it happens only in pyramidal cells, but if it happens anywhere in the brain, and it must, it's got, it should involve pyramidal neurons. It could involve others. Now, if we look inside a, a pyramidal neuron, which is the origin of EEG, we see microtubules. And uh, here's the basilar dendrites, which, which are much bigger, and they go out, and the apical dendrites go to the surface. And here's the axon going down here. And uh, we see that the microtubules in, uh, are, are here. And in dendrites and soma, which, is, which this is, they are interrupted in a mixed polarity. Microtubules can point one way or the other way. And in this situation, they're mixed. They're up and down, mixed together, and interconnected by these networks. So what I'm saying is that this is the most likely place for consciousness to occur in these mixed uh, polarity networks of microtubules in pyramidal uh, soma and dendrites uh, in layer 5. Now, it could happen elsewhere, but if it's going to happen anywhere, it's going to happen there. And there's Bing. Is that, is that beige part down the bottom? Is that, is that the, uh, this is the axon. That's the axon. A axon initiation segment, axon hillock. Yeah, it'd be there. This is the art artistic inter interpretation to make it look nice, but yeah. This, this is the axon. This is the axon hillock or axon initiation segment, they call it now. So, so is the Bing right above that? Or that? I'm, say <laughs> I'm saying Bing, Bing is a collective effect, yeah. And also probably out here through microtubules there to other, to other neurons. And here we see the structure of the microtubule come back to that. So... Um, yeah. Now, f a couple points. First of all, there's no pyramidal neurons in the cerebellum. Uh, Tononi makes a big deal about his phi complexity model predicting that, uh, that there's no uh, consciousness in the cerebellum because it's modular or something like that. But there's no pyramidal neurons in the cerebellum. So if you say, well, consciousness primarily happens in uh, pyramidal neurons, then that explains that. End integration and cortical pyramidal neurons are the most likely site for consciousness from the previous uh, summary slide. And microtubules in the pyramidal neurons are the most likely source of Hodgkin-Huxley deviation from several slides before. Therefore, microtubules and pyramidal dendrites soma are the most likely site for consciousness. So uh, there they are again. And uh, I want to make this point that if you, if you record from uh, a single pyramidal cell, and Christoph Koch did this work, from the, the soma and the apical dendrite at the same time, there's this perfect correlation, despite this being uh, quite far away, 50 microns. Is that right? Uh, 50 microns away, they're perfectly correlated. And uh, this can't happen by membrane propagation. And in the paper, they say well, it's because the, the noise and the, the background noise is, is coherent, is, is perfectly synchronized. But then what's synchronizing that? I don't think that's a really good explanation. I think it could be coming from inside, but we don't really know. The point is that there's this isopotentiality in these cortical neurons. And they don't like to talk about this anymore. It's like an embarrassment. So the final point about this is that the Bing consciousness might ex extend from here through these through inner neurons and basilar dendrites uh, in this layer, and perhaps uh, even, even up to the cortical surface since there's isopotentiality, and other neurons. OK, so what about microtubules? Now, the party line is that they are the structural support. They're the skeleton of the cell and they provide transport. So here we have a, a neuron. This is from this paper here in Science a few years ago. And this is the axon here, and this is a dendrite, because you see it's going to branch. So let's say uh, you're synthesizing something in the cell body that has to go to this synapse out here. How does it get there? 
Well, it's carried by these things called kinesin going this way and then dynein going that way. And uh, whatever the cargo is needs to be delivered to a certain synapse, whether it's here, 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 or wherever. And that means that it has to jump from one microtubule to, an to another, because remember the dendritic microtubules are interrupted and, and uh, <clears throat> mixed polarity. So it has to jump from one to another, and then it's going to come to this branch point. It's got to go, do I go right and do I, or do I go left? So how do the motor proteins know where to deliver their target? It, you know, imagine FedEx or something like that. How, how, what's their, what's their uh, addressing system? Well, it turns out that tau protein, shown here in the red, which is a microtubule associated protein, which is the protein that gets dislodged and hyperphosphorylated in Alzheimer's disease, is the traffic signal and tells the kinesin when to jump off and deliver its cargo. So the tau location on the microtubule is like traffic signals or instructions. So how does the tau know where to go and, and you know, what to tell the, the kinesin? Well, the tau is binding at certain sites on the microtubule. So my argument is that the information is embedded in the microtubule that causes tau to bind on, at certain locations, and that's the coding for delivery of synaptic uh, precursors for memory. And we know that if tau falls off, uh, we get Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, uh, you know, all the beta amyloid outside the neuron gets all the attention and the money, but the real problem of the neurofibrillary tangles due to hyperphosphorylated tau and destabilized microtubules inside the neuron. The beta amyloid plaques by themselves don't really cause any problems unless they really invade the synapse, and even that's questionable. The problem comes from the, um, uh, uh, what's happening inside the neural, the cognitive deficit. The exact same thing happens in uh, something called postoperative cognitive dysfunction uh, in, in anesthesia. If you have too many anesthetics, uh, cognition doesn't quite come back. It sometimes takes a long time. Sometimes it never comes back. Maybe we're unmasking Alzheimer's. Or, but, it, but it looks like uh, anesthetics, uh, pr uh, serial uh, exposures to anesthetics destabilize microtubules and cause this tauopathy. So it's the same disease, pretty much. So what about memory? I mean, we still don't know how memory works uh, because the membrane proteins, these things, are transient and interrupted, being recycled by those, by those kinenes and, and, and kinesins. Um, uh, dynians and kinesins. So one of the things that happens in memory when is calcium comes in and activates this, cam K, this calcium calmodulin forming calcium calmodulin kinase 2, this hexagonal uh, snowflake shaped molecule which then latches onto microtubules and uh, uh, distributes rapidly throughout the local network uh, of microtubules in multiple neurons and you can see that with immunofluorescence. Now CAMK2, I might have talked about this last time, but CAMK2 is, uh, you start with calcium cal calmodulin, calcium comes in, so this is looking at it from the top, this is looking at it from the side, and it, it sprouts into this, uh, snow, this uh, nano robot, or whatever you want to call it, I'm not even sure, with six legs, six kinase domains downward and six kinase domains upward. And here we see the kinase domains on the inner part of the feet, or hands, or whatever you want to call them. And these things phosphorylate something, and whatever they phosphorylate, since they're, they're, they're being flooded into the uh, synapse, uh, from the synapse into the uh, postsynaptic area, uh, dendrite or soma, uh, whatever they, they phosphorylate is a good candidate to store memory because then they're going to get recycled. So what could these things phosphorylate that would make sense in terms of running the show, in terms of organizing things and, and encoding memory? Well, we published this in uh, 2012 that uh, micro, the... the uh, Geometry and size scale of the CAM K2 perfectly matches the microtubule hexagonal lattice. And we also showed in the paper that the uh, phosphorylation gets down to the specific amino acids in the tubulin that can, that can be changed and alter, and alter uh, the state of the tubulin and encode information to bind, bind tau or to do whatever, to, to affect vibrations as we'll get to. So it could be I, that, mic that memory is encoded in microtubules. Um, I think it's really the best bet because membrane uh, proteins don't last long enough. Neurofilaments are possible. Uh, they're very long lasting. But at least for short term or medium term memory encoding, uh, microtubules I think are the most logical candidate. And here is, we show the uh, capacity for information storage uh, depending on the A lattice, B lattice. 
humongous amount of information capacity in just one little neighborhood of, on a microtubule. So this is where memory could be. Which leads to the general uh, topic of information processing in microtubules, which I uh, first published on in 1982, wrote a book about in 1987, and uh, then started applying Froehlich coherence and working with physicists like Steen Rasmussen, looking at uh, quantum coherence, or not quantum, but coherence of microtubules processing information like microtubule automata. So the idea is that there's the synapse coming in, this is actin, and here's the microtubules. Notice how they're different they are in the dendrite uh, than in the axon where they're continuous and unipolar. So the, I'm saying the information uh, memory gets stored here and processing goes on here which, which then initiate, uh, influences uh, firing here. In other words, why, why are we paying attention only to the membrane instead of looking at what's inside? In medicine it would be like looking at dermatology instead of all of medicine, just looking at the, at the surface. Okay, so another factor about this is where do psychoactive drugs act to alter consciousness? Um, most people would say, you know, for example, fi uh, serotonin receptors, 5-HT receptors, the uh, SSRIs, the antidepressants, they have this effect on the membrane inhibiting reuptake of serotonin immediately, and yet it takes several weeks for the antidepressant effect to kick in because um, the microtubule cytoskeleton needs to reorganize, and I'll give you a reference for that later. Uh, GABA receptors are thought to mediate effects of benzodiazepines and anesthetics. I'll come to anesthetics later, but benzodiazepines actually don't really bind to GABA receptors. They alter slightly the binding of GABA to GABA receptors. The point is that all of these drugs are nonpolar and they're going to get into the cell and they're going to bind to microtubules also, in addition to anything they're, they're binding to at the, at the membrane surface, including opiates, opioids. Now, as far as uh, uh, well, NMDA, we'll come back to. So, um, I'll just take these individuals. I kind of said this before, but membrane effect immediate, but antidepressant effect takes weeks as cytoskeletal microtubules reorganize. There's a reference. Um, GABA, they don't bind, they just alter the binding of GABA to the GABA receptor. And anyway, the, here's a GABA receptor, and here's the microtubules. So it's kind of like the GABA receptor is the tip of the iceberg of the microtubules anyway. So it's literally uh, one big system. Uh, NMDA receptors, ketamine, uh, everybody's always wondered about how ketamine can, can do something to the NMDA receptor and yet uh, and be an anesthetic and yet cause uh, dissociation and, and hallucinations and people floating on the ceiling and, and then they come back and they're perfectly fine. It's a great drug in anesthesia, by the way. And uh, uh, it turns out they also bind to uh, microtubules. This is from uh, studies looking for ketamine toxicity because it causes postoperative cognitive dysfunction. And uh, it, it induces tau hyperphosphorylation in, uh, that's a microtubule. It's kind of hard to see, it's kind of dark. But, but uh, trust me, that's a microtubule. And it's all messed up uh, if you give too much ketamine. So ketamine binds, binds to microtubules as well as an NMDA receptor. Okay, now anesthetics. I'm an anesthesiologist. I make my living uh, passing gas, as it, as it were. Putting people to sleep, waking them up. I've been doing it almost 40 years. And in my field, we still don't really know how anesthetics work although it's looking like they're acting on microtubules, which is what you would want if you have a theory of consciousness based on microtubules. And they spare non-conscious functions. We do evoke potentials during anesthesia. The patient's unconscious, but their brain is receiving inputs. So where do anesthetics work? Well, going back over 100 years ago, these two guys, Meyer and Overton, showed that the potency of a bunch of gases, which are anesthetics, and they looked at different animals, mice, writing reflex, you know, what concentration they would, they would get back up and... And, and get off their back, and, and, uh, and tadpoles when they would start to swim, all different animals, and they got the MAC, the, essentially the ED50, the mean alveolar concentration, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the potency of the drug, and looked for, looked for a whole bunch of physical parameters of what they uh, would correlate, what the potency would correlate with, and they found that the co potency over many, many orders of magnitude correlated with solubility in olive oil, of all things, gas partition coefficient. So methoxyfluorine is the most potent anesthetic. You only need uh, 0.25%, uh, halothane 0.75%, and then just go up and up. Nitrogen in many, many atmospheres. But it all correlates per perfectly over many orders of magnitude with solubility in olive oil. Now what that means is if you d ground up your body uh, into different solubility parameters, polar, like blood, water, would be out here. Nonpolar, fat, would be down here. And right in here, the aromatic rings, the aromatics, 
uh, phenylalanine, benzene, uh, benzene type rings, and certain amino acids. Three, four, and five are where anesthetics bind, which is probably where consciousness comes from, down here, not from the polar parts of the body or the parts of the brain. So uh, Rod, e Rod Eckenhoff, who's a uh, uh, researcher at Penn, has studied uh, anesthetics, and he didn't, he didn't start with a bias, like it must, must be microtubule. He started completely open and did a number of very interesting studies, um, proteomics and genomics. For example, halothane, an anesthetic, binds to 57 proteins in, in the human uh, in cortex, 23 membrane proteins, and 34 soluble cytoplasmic proteins, including tubulin and microtubules. Genomic functions point to functions of microtubules. They also showed that exposure of primary cortical neurons to halothane alters genetic expression of seven proteins, three common to both, anesthetics tubulin, and two others which don't seem to have anything to do with the signaling mechanism. No changes in membrane protein genetic expression. So this suggests that anesthetics are doing their functional uh, act action on microtubules. Proteomics and genomics point to microtubules. Another study they did that just came out earlier this year, direct modulation of microtubule stability contributes to anthracene general anesthesia where they, they gave, the, the, this is optogenetics, they gave this uh, fluorescent an anthracene to, uh, to tadpoles who have conveniently transparent heads and then they could illuminate them with the uh, fluorescent uh, wavelength and make the active anesthetic and the tadpoles turned over. They, they became anesthetized. And then they ground up their brains, they donated their little brains to science, and they found that the anthracene was, was bound to microtubules, to tubulin. And they mentioned that it was consistent with our quantum mobility theory. That was nice of them. So in tubulin, so here's a tubulin molecule, and Travis Craddock did this work, and he, he uh, uh, located the aromatic rings. Remember the nonpolar aromatic rings from uh, amino acids, tryptophan, uh, tri tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine, where anesthetics bind, where uh, consciousness is likely to come from, in, somewhere in the brain. And here we see in the red the halothane molecules uh, in the midst of all these uh, aromatic amino acids. There's actually 32 amino acids in tubulin. And uh, here's where the anesthetics bind. They're very close to the uh, aromatic rings in, in kind of a hydrophobic nonpolar region. It's like oil and water. The oily uh, nonpolar groups want to get together and the, get rid of the water on the outside. So the water's out here and inside it's, it's a convenient uh, and conducive for anesthesia binding. So um, if we take a step back and, and say, okay, information processing in microtubules, we have about a billion uh, tubulins per neuron, switching at about 10 to the seventh, uh, I'll tell you where I get that number later, ops per second, it's, it's mega, 10 megahertz, gives about 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron. Now the singularity and all those guys are saying there's 10 to the 16th operations per brain per second. So they don't like this very much because it, it pushes their goalposts way, way down, way into the future. Uh, so that, I'm not very popular with those guys. Uh, as, nor is Roger, for, for different reasons, Roger Penrose, my, my collaborator. This gives about 10 to the 27th operations per second per the brain, for the brain. But this doesn't, it doesn't explain consciousness, feelings, awareness, experience, nor understanding. Roger's girdle, uh, Roger Penrose's girdle theorem argument can boil down to the, the fact that computers can do a lot of amazing things. They don't understand anything. And John Searle made that same point with this Chinese room. It's pretty much the same argument. Uh, is consciousness a computation? I don't think it is. In fact, I'm coming around to the point of view that consciousness is more, more like music than a computation. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it's more like music. I'll just leave it at that. So where's the bing? How, how do we get there? And so a little bit about the, the quantum physics. Roger wrote this book, and I've been studying microtubules for years but in, in the early 90s, but didn't have a mechanism. It had a structure, but not a mechanism. He had a mechanism, not a structure. He basically said that uh, quantum superposition is, I, I went over this last time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Separation in underlying reality, like the multiple worlds, the separations are unstable and reduced by an objective threshold given by the indeterminacy principle. Each such OR event is accompanied by subjective experience, and the choices are influenced by platonic values embedded in space-time geometry. So he did a very nice cartoon where a matter is curvature in space-time, so a particle in two different positions would be curvature in slightly different directions. A superposition of the particle being in two places at once would be a separation in the fine scale structure of the universe, like the multiple worlds hypothesis, except 
that these separations are unstable and after time t will self-collapse and that's a moment of consciousness. Uh, I won't go into the rationale, uh, several books written about this and uh, it's kind of like Sherlock Holmes said, when you rule out the impossible, whatever's left must be correct, no matter how seemingly improbable. That's one way to look at it. But there's more to it than that. But, but uh, I mean, Christos is now a panpsychist, so if, this, if, if consciousness is a property of matter, I think it's more likely that it's a property of wave function collapse. Now, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics of the consciousness causes collapse. This is saying that collapse is consciousness. When you have this type of collapse, by the indeterminacy principle, you have a little moment of consciousness. But they're very simple, normally. They have to be organized or orchestrated to make fully con uh, full consciousness. These are ubiquitous. They're the same as decoherence. Uh, but the subjectivity lacks cognition or meaning. They're proto-conscious moments. Uh, but they're discrete uh, snapshots, kind of like Christoph said in that article, like whitehead occasions or Buddhist moments. So I think a lot of, a lot of converging ideas give us that uh, consciousness is a sequence of discrete events. And this is consistent with Eastern thought that proto-consciousness is everywhere. But how could these be orchestrated, in the, uh, uh, occur in the brain and be combined or orchestrated uh, into meaningful cognitive fully conscious events with rich phenomenology? Uh, microtubules are the answer, acting as quantum computers. So we developed this theory, the or orchestrated objective reduction theory with a protein qubit and microtubules inside neurons. And uh, first started in 1994, this was. There's Dave Chalmers on the far left, Roger in the yellow shirt. And the basic idea was in a microtube, you had a, a buildup of quantum superposition that reached threshold for collapse by equals h over t. There's a moment of consciousness. And these selected tubules then go on to uh, trigger uh, firing or not trigger firing, or store memory. So the basic idea, our original idea was, if you go back to this uh, space-time qubit or quantum bit, we equated it to a quantum bit of a tubulin being two different conformations and a superposition of both to build a quantum computer. It turns out you don't need this conformational change and it causes trouble because it requires ener energy and generates heat. So uh, in 2002, we switched to a more uh, physiological uh, sensible idea that there's really dipole states along these, uh, remember the aromatic rings can have dipole states in different directions and a superposition of dipoles in both states. So uh, I showed you this before and um, this is very similar to the, what's uh, happening in quantum coherence in photosynthesis pro uh, proteins by exciton hopping. So in photosynthesis, plants collect uh, photons and transfer the en energy to make food uh, through these uh, multiple uh, cr chromophores, uh, which are essentially acting like uh, the aromatic amino acids do, we claim, in, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in tubulin to get the energy over here. And the, and the, the excitons occupy all possible pathways simultaneously to get there, which is why we have efficient food production while we're all alive today. Without it, you know, we might not have life on this planet without, uh, without very efficient photosynthesis due to this quantum coherence mechanism. And I think Bridget Whaley is here, maybe Fleming is too, here. Some of these guys are here at Berkeley. So, so basically, uh, the idea is that we have a pathway, uh, w which is where uh, anesthetics act to give us the dipoles and these dipoles are representing the information and uh, uh, to make a qubit out of a, a dipole pathway qubit. Now it also could be spin. In our recent paper, Raj and I uh, said it also could be spin in different directions. Pretty much the, the same idea. So we have topological bits or qubits which could be vibrational states of the microtubule. So the idea is that the dipoles different states. We have a quantum superposition, uh, which I think psych I can talk about this later if anybody want, uh, wants to discuss further. Psychedelic drugs may actually promote this quantum superposition and increase the uh, topological uh, vibrations in the microtubule. So, okay, that's all uh, theory. Now what about evidence? So uh, this fellow, Anurban Banyapati, uh, from National Institute of Material Sciences in, in Scuba, Japan, is now at MIT. And in 2009, he began to do these studies of an individual microtubule, and he put four electrodes on an individual microtubule, two to stimulate and two to record. And, he, and if you don't stimulate them, they're, they're conductors. But if you stimulate and sweep the frequency of stimulation, you find resonant frequencies, for example, at about 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz, down as low as 10 kilohertz, uh, 
in, in uh, you can see the microchip at the top. So at these particular frequencies, the resistance drops. Now it's still, it's not quantum uh, necessarily because you have a, a finite resistance between the electrode and the microtubule, but you get these uh, uh, sharp resonance peaks at specific resonant frequencies in megahertz, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of them. So this is an individual uh, microtubules. Uh, you can show the, uh, here's the resonance peaks here from uh, about uh, 10 kilohertz through megahertz through gigahertz, actually, in individual microtubules. He then, uh, oh, I forgot the, um, I've got to show you this. Well, I'll come back to that. So he, uh, he took these uh, scanning tunneling microscope tips. So this is nanotechnology, you know, uh, to, to, where you can see atoms. You move with piezoelectrodes, you're very slightly. And, and basically, a, um, a, 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 electrodes normally used in phys physiology are humongous compared to this, which comes to a single atom tip. So you can insert it, say, up to here into the neuron, and it doesn't, doesn't perturb the neuron. You get much sharper signals from what's going on inside the neuron. So, the, so he then, for example, could put two of these into a single neuron process, into one dendrite here, for example. Um, and here's one that, that's actually broken at the very top. That bridge is just a bundle of microtubules and actually recorded right from that, so you don't need the membrane. And, uh, okay, that's what I want to show you. So forget all this other stuff. Okay, so he did those studies, putting them into, uh, into neurons. And uh, so um, these were from individual microtubules. And then he got, uh, this is from... Uh, neurons, sorry, from microtubules inside active neurons. These are in culture while the neurons are, are firing, the membranes are depolarizing. And uh, the caveat here is this hasn't been published yet. It's being written up uh, by the people at MIT, and I'm waiting to hear uh, the status of that paper. So um, the point is that you have, in this case, four resonance bands that are spaced about every three orders of magnitude, kind of like a fractal hierarchy or recurs something uh, repeating over scales. Um, now, what's missing down here? Um, well, I'll come back to that point. So by theoretical predictions, let me go back. So we have 10 to the third, uh, 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 10 kilohertz, uh, which gives uh, uh, 10 to the minus fourth seconds coherence time. By prediction and experimental evidence, we have coherence times up to 10 to the minus fourth seconds, but they're still too short for known correlates of consciousness like EEG, 40 hertz gamma synchrony, and so forth. So Roger came up with the idea that there were like uh, inverse harmonics or beat frequencies. So if you have like megahertz vibrations, they're slightly different. They're going to give beats, just like in music. And here we have like 800 versus 840. It's too hard to make this megahertz. And you can see that you get beats at 40 hertz. So in our uh, most recent paper, Roger Penrose and I suggest that EEG is the tip of an iceberg of a fractal hierarchy of dynamics that goes into uh, kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, maybe faster inside the, inside the neuron, in the microtubules. And that what we see is the EEG is the tip of an iceberg of this fractal hierarchy. So here I've taken the previous slide and I've just put in uh, the EEG spectrum. And you could imagine it would go negative like these, but that's not how it's recorded. So this is, this is just the EEG spectrum. You see it fits fairly well as a, as a fifth... Uh, uh, band, resonance band of what's going on. So I think, uh, I think uh, uh, activity relevant to consciousness goes uh, to, from gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, up into hertz in EEG. So consciousness occurs across scale and as I said before it's more like music than computation. And if megahertz quantum vibrations and microtubules mediate consciousness, then applying megahertz vibrations, for example, ultrasound, to the brain should affect mood. And we heard Sterling talking about that before. So uh, uh, I try, uh, I was talking about this with my colleagues, and I said, we should really try this on chronic pain patients who, uh, who are depressed, you know, see if it affects their mood. And they said, we're trying on ourselves first. It's your idea. You've got a shaved head. You're first. So there I was, and uh, uh, actually, I, I tried it myself first. This is a follow-up, and I gave it to my, I, I put it here for about 15, uh, this is an ultrasound machine we use in the OR, 
and it gives imaging because what happens is the waves go in, they bounce back, and this, this recedes. And then, so there, the, the thick line is my skull, and you can see the layers of, uh, of my frontal and, and temporal cortex. It's a lousy imaging device because it's got to go through the skull twice to get the picture. Um, but it's, it's uh, approved for imaging, which is how we got it approved to the IRB because it was already approved for brain imaging. So, um, um, as Sterling mentioned, uh, recently uh, Jamie Tyler's group published in Nature Neuroscience that focused ultrasound improves cognitive discrimination and sensory discrimination task. They're using focus. They're trying to aim at one point. The, the, the device I use is scans. It's kind of like a broad spectrum uh, hitting wide parts of frontal temporal cortex. You can also focus it. In fact, um, ultrasound, unlike transcranial, uh, transcranial magnetic and transcranial electrical, can be focused a, a, to depth. So we published the first uh, study on, uh, on mental states, mood, so a slight improvement in mood. Uh, then I got my colleagues involved, Jay Sanguinetti, and he's, we have several studies done that haven't been written up yet, improves mood in volunteers. And then two other studies at the cellular level, Uma Rahman, who presented the Consciousness Conference, and Sadviki Gupta, uh, and I'll show you what, uh, what they showed. So um, can you see these? We could kill the lights. Yeah. All right. So, um, thank you. So, uh, Uma, Uma Raman, an undergrad student, uh, did this in Surav Ghosh's lab, and they, she got cortical uh, neurons, embryonic neurons, grew them in culture, and before they formed networks, exposed them to ultrasound for, uh, I think, two minutes, uh, two megahertz for two minutes, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure. Anyway, and then four hours later, she counted them all, blinded as to which ones got ultrasound and which ones didn't, and just counted how many in each group had more neurite, because uh, these things eventually will grow neurites, like here and here. You can see that. And uh, anyway, she got a significant increase in the number of ultrasound-exposed neurons that had uh, neurites. And um, by 24 hours, this is at four hours, by 24 hours, they, everything had averaged out from the one exposure. So it probably needs to be repeated. But in a brain injury, traumatic brain injury, since say, you want to make new connections, you want to grow new, not necessarily new neurons, but new connections from damaged neurons, stimulating, assuming it's working on microtubules, whatever it's doing, if you're making new neurites, that's, that should help. And also because of Alzheimer's disease, uh, the microtubules fall apart, it should help that also, maybe. Now, uh, about Alzheimer's, uh, Sadviki Gupta uh, did a study on polymerization microtubule assembly uh, and with and without ultrasound and uh, uh, you can't do it in the device because you can't put the ultrasound in the spectrophotometer we measure but they figure out a way to do it and then make a long and then check for uh, checked afterwards and the uh, sample with the ultrasound exposure stayed fairly constant whereas the sample without ultrasound exposure started to decay or to de depolymerize suggesting that the uh, Ultrasound stabilized the microtubules and, and promoted uh, microtubules as opposed to disassembling. So this is why it should, in principle, be uh, helpful in Alzheimer's because your microtubules fall apart. And we're combining uh, those the last two studies into one one paper. I'm going to write up. Okay, so um, I'm going to close and just uh, say here are the uh, references from the recent. Um, uh, uh, paper I wrote with Roger Penrose, including uh, seven, uh, including a re reply to two different groups of commentaries, including the bottom one, which was quite negative, and we had to deal with them separately. And so let me conclude by saying that um, quantum vibrations, or just vibrations, uh, orchestrated in reduction in microtubules mediate consciousness, regulate neuronal firings, and connect consciousness to the fine scale non local structure of the universe, which is how you solve the hard problem, I think. EEG and neuronal membrane activities may emerge as beats of smaller scale, higher frequency microtubule vibrations, for example, 10 megahertz. Consciousness extends over scales like music. Tuning the brain by treating quantum vibrations in brain microtubules via megahertz, ultrasound, TUS, drugs, because I think if drugs are acting on microtubules anyway, even though we don't realize it, or meditative techniques where you're chanting and doing resonances in your body may promote this, may activate microtubules to improve mental and neurological conditions. Thank you. When you say uh, microtubules are in like a quantum superposition of states, do you know um, like how robust those superpositions are to noise? Because I know from 
like a physics background, it's really, really hard to right. get something into Decoherence, like, yeah. a superposition state. So do you have any idea of like what the time scales are? Well, we know that uh, quantum, uh, coherence time is 10 to the minus 4 seconds uh, from modern bonds. Cause, uh, so we know it's at least a uh, ten thousandth of a second. So uh, in 2000, Max Tegmark uh, published a paper that was kind of an ambush. Uh, I think he was out to get Rogers, kind of like a Wild West gunslinger shooting for Wyatt Earp or something. So he wrote this really stupid paper in Physics Review E that said that, uh, it, it, and the surface attempted to prove the obvious, the microtubules are too warm, wet, and noisy for quantum coherence. And he came up with this, uh, this de so here's the decoherence formula. The coherence time is going to be equal to, uh, notice the temperature is in the numerator, which doesn't make sense, because as the temperature goes up, this should lengthen. But uh, he, he calculated 10 to the minus 13 seconds decoherence time. Way, way, way too short. However, he made a couple of mistakes. The superposition separation he used was 24 nanometers, whereas our separation is the fe uh, Fermi level femtometers, the level of the uh, nuclei. So a, superposition, uh, a tubulin superposition means that it's w separated from itself by the diameter of its atomic nucleus, which is extremely tiny. Number, number, that's number one. Number two, it's happening in the quantum. So when you correct all this, you get to 10 to the minus fourth seconds, which has been shown experimentally. It's also happening in the nonpolar hydrophobic region away from the, away from the polar thermal interactions. So um, everybody says the brain is too warm, wet, and noisy. It's not too warm because we now know that there's quantum coherence at room temperature, Bose-Einstein condensates, photosynthesis, uh, it's not too wet because it's happening in the nonpolar dry part of the, of the cell and of the protein where there's no water, there's no polarity. And it's not too noisy because the noise in the brain is actually correlated and it's probably signal. So what you just said was the party line, it is the party line, but it's just been, been shown to be wrong. That there's, there's warm, otherwise there wouldn't be photosynthesis uh, happening at, at, in sunlight, for example. In the back, Dr. Searle, John Searle. Well, I have so many questions. I don't want to start. But let me start with one I'm sure you've heard before, and that is what's special about neurons on your account? That's one uh, uh, superposition. That's not special with neurons. Only in neurons are microtubules, only in neuronal dendrites and soma, not even axons, just neuronal dendrites and soma are microtubules interrupted. Okay, all other cells, they start in the cell body, uh, near, near the nuclear cell body, and go like spokes of a wheel, continuously. They're not interrupted with a plus inward and the minus out. They're all the same polarity. In dendrites and soma, they're interrupted. So obviously they're not there for structural support. You wouldn't want a girder in a building to be broken and then start over here. They're short interrupted and of mixed polarity. It's unique in all of biology. No other cell, and even in neurons, only in dendrites and soma. And they can be, uh, I used to think they need to be entangled through gap junctions that may or may not be true because on a bunch of they can be entangled across neurons. So the uniqueness comes in the dendrites and soma of brain neurons. Is this specifically pyramidal neurons? No, all, all dendrites and, uh, and soma. Even, even peripheral ones, I think. Well, but, the, neuron, the neurons in the stomach could be conscious, for example. Some people, yeah, or the heart. Some people argue for the heart. But, you know, it's possible. And there could be memory in the heart. I mean, we, we hear all these weird stories of people get heart transplants and pick up memories from the donor. And... Um, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, um, I think only in the brain do you really have enough of these connected in one uh, coherent uh, system to have consciousness. What about water? A coherent water in the matrix outside? Yeah. Um, oh, outside the neurons? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, well, I think there is non-locality, whether that needs to go through water or not. Some people think the water inside the microtubule hollow core is ordered in, in a coherent state in gigahertz. So there's all, all kinds of possibilities with, with water. But, but in... The uh, work of Gerald Pollack. Yeah. In that fourth phase of water, and the uh, surface areas around all of the materials in the brain, there's going to be this extended zone, he calls it. Right. No, I'm all for that. I, I, I know his work and I like it a lot. And I think that that's going to be more conducive to avoiding decoherence if the water is ordered, if they're all vibrating at the same frequency, for example. So I'm all for that. Walter Freeman has been suggesting basically a quantum theory, quantum field theory with Vitiello. Right. And, you know, uh, his 
approach ha has basically come to that as a conclusion. And it's not at all inc you know, incongruent with what right. you have, which is really brilliant in a way. Oh, well, thank you. Because you have an extended condensed phase. You have to explain all parts of the condensed phase, right. not just one part. Yeah, uh, I know that work. In fact, I wrote a uh, I wrote a commentary on their paper uh, about dark dark ma dark energy or something, yeah. and they basically had two fields, uh, kind of the the pre, kind of like the integration field and the firing field. Right. It's really a question of what is the, the appropriate mathematics to treat it. I'm not sure what work theory is, but it seems that there's a rich apparatus for QFT that would be more appropriate to use. Maybe, but it, it comes down to almost a religious preference. For one thing, QFT doesn't have collapse. And it doesn't come down to a re religious preference. There's a, a coherence and you know, history in condensed matter physics. Right. You know, it, it, it's not, a, you know, like history is there. Right. It's been validated for... No, I, uh, there's no pro I have no problem with quantum field theory, but there's no collapse in quantum field theory. And being a... Well, phase transitions that... Well, you could say that. Yellow and others have been talking about it. Yellow had a fractal analysis of phase and time just two years ago, three years ago. Yeah. And he's also talked about microtubules and dissipative dynamics. And I, I just saw him at the Tucson conference. No, I'm, I'm all for that. It, I, I guess the only difference, well, the difference would be A, we're pinpointing in the microtubules in the, these quantum channels, we're calling them inside the microtubules. With the, the pathways I showed you would correlate with specific vibrations. Um, so, for example, around one helical pattern would be one uh, 10 megahertz, another one would be something else. So the pathways can correlate, which means that experimentally what we want to do, and I hope to do this next year or two, or hope Honorbon does it, is, is give anesthesia to these neurons and s with the intraneuronal scanning tunneling probe to see if the high frequency uh, fr uh, vibrations go away. And also to give psychoactives. It, it, I, be very curious to see what happens if you gave LSD to one of these neurons. I would bet that the frequency would go up, that the resonant frequency go, you know, would shift maybe towards the gigahertz, for example. So I, th Can I ask yeah. Uh, if Presti is sort of perhaps knowledgeable, is there a cell-based model for um, psychoactive drugs which could be directly employed to do that? Well, <clears throat> I think the idea that internal binding of, of uh, various drugs to microtubules is a great, you know, wonderful and, and eminently testable hypothesis. So more power to yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's a very good question. I, I talked, well, I, I think the vi there is now. There didn't used to be. I, ta I had a, uh, I got started on this end of it. I, I was talking to, uh, our, one of our, our chair of pharmacology gave a talk about new opiates, non-addictive opiates, which I thought was a pipe dream, so to speak. But um, and because th this particular drug was going to, it caused despondency. I said, well, you worried it's going to, you know, it didn't cause euphoria, but it, it looked like it might cause, I said, you, you're going to give that to a patient? And go, anyway, I said, it's nonpolar, right? He says, so it gets in the neuron, right? I go, how do you know it binds to tubulin? He goes, well, everything binds to tubulin. I go, well, why don't you study that? Well, nobody studies that. And, but then he had a very good point. He said, well, what are you going to study? Because up till recently, you would give a, a drug or something, and see if the microtubules destabilized, stabilized, polymerized, depolymerized. That's all you could look at. Now, we can give drugs and look at these vibrational frequencies of the microtubules and see what happens to them. I, like I'm saying, I'm predicting that, that psychoactive drugs will shift it to the high frequency, anesthesia will take it away. Maybe we could uh, take yeah. more questions. And sure. then I do have a take on that, but Sorry. Sterling. Um, I just recently had a family member pass away, and I was wondering, what? It, how does your model account for uh, brain death, like lack of oxygen? And is it in the case of uh, brain death, is there a way to free, maybe possibly freeze the brain and like take it layer by layer and then recreate it by uh, measuring the states of the microtubules? Is there, or is that even possible? Or? Well, you raised about six interesting subjects there. Yeah. Let me first say that, that uh, you know, um, end-of-life brain activity. We use these monitors in anesthesia. They're simple EEG devices. It, 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 they're just frontal because nobody wants to mess with anything else. And they process it, and they give you an idiot number from 0 to 100. It's something to do with EEG, probably gamma, probably 
temporal muscle. They don't really, it's proprietary. They give you an idiot number from zero to 100. Awake people are 80 to 100. 80 to 100. You want your patients between 40 and 60 so they won't be awake and they won't remember and they won't see you. That's basically what these things are for because people waking up under, under anesthesia. So a few years ago, a, a, a <clears throat> palliative medicine guy at George Washington, Lachmir Chawla, started putting these brain monitors on his patients as they were dying. You know, they decided to withdraw, withdraw support, they were hopeless, whatever. And, and uh, so what happens is the number goes goes down. It's it probably starts you know below around 40 or, or lower because they're not really with it. It goes down to about zero, and then about the time the heart stops, there's this burst of activity that lasts 90 seconds to 20 minutes in some cases. And they analyzed it. And it was gamma synchrony. Now George Mashur did the same study in rats that he presented at the Tucson conference, where he gave lethal he put all these fancy EEG monitors on rats, gave potassium to the heart, stopped immediately. And with 30 seconds, there's this burst of gamma activity. Now, what that means, nobody knows. Um, but it's not random spasmodic firings or activity of neurons because it's highly coherent across both hemispheres. It sure looks like consciousness as far as any, anybody. Now, is it just because there's this, it's this huge stimulus? Hey, I, j I just died, and you know, now what? Or, you know, some people suggest it could be the soul leaving the body. Well, who knows? I mean, you can't, you can't, if consciousness is happening in space-time geometry, it could be non-local. We can't, you know, you can't say it's impossible. Until somebody can show how consciousness occurs in the brain, you can't say it's impossible out of the brain. I'm not claiming any proof for that. I'm just saying you can't say it's impossible. Did the um, MIT microtubule studies, did they, did they find instantaneous, um, uh, like instant, uh, instantaneous transport along the tubule? With the, then we're looking at transport. They're, they're looking at just individual microtubules and measuring the uh, conductance between two electrodes. Yeah, uh, I'm just saying. So, but if there's a conductance between the two electrodes, then that means that there's it's not synchronous entirely. Oh, 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 yeah, it's a very low, uh, it's attawatts, it's some really low, uh, low power. Um, what you're saying, is there a flow, or is well, it... I mean, like, so you were talking about how the, the, the neurons themselves are, like, they, down the axon, you have some sort of coherence. Yeah, or the dendrite, that's... Yeah, the, the dendrite, you have some sort of coherence, and you would expect to find the same thing along the microtubule, if that... I'm not sure about that. I, I, I see what you're getting at. Um, they're applying AC, and they're getting, uh, it just puts it in a state. I, you're saying that there must be flow along that? But it might be just you know one electron moving a little bit and shoving the next one down. So it's pretty much, for all practical purposes, it would be instantaneous. And then we know that happens in neurons through the isopotentiality. Right. That's a good question. I'll have to, th I have to think about that. I, I, I think I see your point. You had said earlier from the, the Christoph paper uh, that they believe that consciousness happens in the third pathway, right, from the frontal cortex. Well, that was before all this stuff, but I think he would be, I think he deserves credit for for presaging that. Okay, but, but you would argue against that, that, that consciousness is happening through all those things? No, I think it's in the third wave. I think if you think about, you need uh, time to build up, to reach threshold for, for self-collapse. It, it's, it's an interesting question, but I, I think it's probably happening in the third wave. Because those microtubules and those neurons are present the whole time. Right, right, as they are in every other cell. Uh, so why aren't they happening in one or two? I don't know. That's a good question. I think for some reason, maybe you need to get to, to the pyramidal cells. Maybe you need the... Uh, pyramidal cells in B1, right? Like early visual cortex, there's pyramidal cells. Yeah. And they're constantly receiving input. So why isn't there consciousness there? Why yeah. does it have to go to the prefrontal cortex first? Well, I, I don't know the answer. That's a very good question. I've thought about that. But by E equals H over T, you need a significant amount of time. And uh, or even if it's B frequency, so you need a, you need enough time to reach threshold for self collapse. But that that's a good question. I don't have a good answer for it. Okay. I'm thinking about time it. Time is kind of continuous, right? Like we're constantly receiving. What is that time with respect to? Like enough time from from what? From onset of stimulus or? All right. So if if you're you see me, and, and by the time it, it goes to the back of your brain, the front of your brain, and then projects to the th third area, that's probably going to be three to five hundred milliseconds. But yet you may respond to me at one hundred milliseconds, which is taken to mean that you're you're not your consciousness is epiphenomenal and illusory. Uh, 
The only way around that is to have this funny backward time effect that Benjamin Libet discovered in 1979 that's been rediscovered over and over again, but which the neuroscientists, uh, including Christoph, who found it in his own uh, study but, but discarded it, this funny backward time effect which can give you, uh, uh, send information backward in time so that you can respond consciously in real time. So even though the activity uh, that tells you what to say hasn't happened yet, it's sent backwards in time. Now this backward time effect can only happen in quantum mechanics, quantum physics, and it, it, it could happen in the brain. I have a, another paper about that called How Quantum Brain Biology Can Rescue Conscious Free Will, which shows how backward time effects is necessary for real-time conscious control. I don't think you answered his question. The question is, if the microtubules in V1 are firing continuously, then there's a continuous passage of time right there in V1. Why isn't it conscious? I don't know, okay? I, th I think, it, you know, you could say that, that they don't have the right conditions, they don't have the isolation, they don't have the right configuration, but, but, but I don't know. I think it has something to do with time, but I don't have a good answer for that. So the cor cor cell types across the neural cortex are, are quite similar, right? Like even in V1 and then if you go to prefrontal cortex, the, the, the neocortex is very uniform uh, across, right? So there's different regions that may respond differently or act differently or do different things, but the structure of a paper right. column is about the same. An answer to that question would be, it is conscious, it's just not us. <laughs> that is an answer. Yes. <laughs> so you, you sound like a uh, higher order thought person, that it has to go to prefrontal cortex for it to be us, to have s sense of self. It could be. Well, like Tononi has complexes, and the main complexes are experience and then subcomplex a, a zombie for example <laughs> not that I believe to know that's good as you say uh, about the Tenoni point Tenoni has this theory that uh, there's like some qualia space of consciousness and some sort of geometric shape um, and how you can measure integrated information and that's a measure of consciousness in some way and so um, does your uh, platonic values at space-time geometry could that somehow relate to Tenoni's theory on building some integrated information and yeah maybe except in except uh, space-time geometry in my view is something real it actually exists at the Planck scale and the other thing about that is somebody pointed out to me that Tononi's uh, his whole thing is based on uh, phi is from the golden mean and the Fibonacci uh, uh, series and all that geometry but he doesn't have anything physical to hang it on it's all in I don't know Hilbert space or abstract space or something whereas microtubules have uh, Fibonacci geometry and the hexagonal geometry and all the other stuff that he's, ta he's talking about, but he doesn't have any, he, he has nothing to hang it on, is what I'm saying. I'm hanging it on microtubules and then space time geometry. Other than that, exactly the same, except he doesn't have any biology or philosophy in it or physics. Yeah? Uh, the, uh, the Penrose is idealized in the sense that it has a beat that's um, the, the beats would be very, um, the frequency of the beats would, um, just from physics, would, would vary quite a bit if the actual um, the, the parent frequencies varied a tiny amount. And it, it, it seems like... Well, excuse me, it's the difference between the two. Exactly. So, so if, if they, if they the change the, together, the beats are going to stay the same. But EEG does change. If they change together... Well, that's, that, that's the point. It, it seems like the, the EEG would, would smear out quite a bit if the, if, the, um, if the higher frequencies vary just a very tiny amount in, in their, because they're so high. And if they, unless they were totally in synchrony, the, 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 the resulting beat yeah. frequency would change quite a bit. And, and you, I, I, don't, I don't know that we see that. I mean, you got... Well, gamma comes and goes in different areas. Yes, but, but it, it, it doesn't seem like the numbers would work out because they... Because well, the numbers in our paper... Uh, unless, unless you're talking about very, uh, a high, high synchrony between the, 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 the higher frequencies that, that would change to, to produce those beats. Well, I think, it, well, you, I, I think there can be fairly constant synchrony. Microtubules structurally have this uh, resonant structure, and at a given amount of energy, they're going um, to vibrate coherently, synchronously. So I'm not sure I see that as a big problem. 
what you're saying is if, if this one changes and this one doesn't, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, maybe that's true, and the, and, the, and the EEG would go away for that particular area or, ch or change or slow down or whatever. But if they move together, then it should be okay. Or, or gamma would just move, you know, yeah. down in the beta. That sounds like uh, Got Gotham's study of where you see the patterns moving. I meant, I meant to say that during the uh, looking at the pyramidal cells, uh, uh, that, act and this also might relate to John's question, why you're not conscious of V1, that it needs to be within some kind of envelope that can, that can move around. But I'm not sure that's the right answer. John. If consciousness really is a property of individual microtubules in the third phase, and presumably billions of them, why is there a unified conscious field? Why does my consciousness mm -hmm. come as a single conscious field? Entanglement. Because all those microtubules are entangled in the one unified, just like a Bose-Einstein condensate. And it was just shown that Bose-Einstein condensation, something like what a laser is, can occur at room temperature. It used to be at absolute zero uh, temperature, no but now they're, they're doing it at, room, at, at, at warm temperature. So your consciousness is entangled as a unified, coherent entity. Maybe there's consciousness, like you said, in V1, but it's not entangled, or, or something like that. Actually, I kind of like that idea, because... Uh, uh, you could call it proto-conscious or something like that. But, but binding or unity of your consciousness is because all those microtubules or portions of a, of a bunch of microtubules are entangled and coherent in one system. So does, does that entanglement, does, so you have this time, coherent time period, right, that you were talking about with regard to Tejmar, for example? Oh, yeah. So we know... Does that we, entanglement, does that, does that have to occur? During that time, it's entangled, yeah. And so, so all of them are going last at that time moment of how many? Well, we know, we know experimentally that 10, 10 to the minus 4 seconds at, at warm temperature because we have 10 kilohertz resonant frequencies. So somehow during that time period, they're all entangled. For Correct. And then, and then, and then it, at the end of that interval, at the end of 10 to the minus 4 seconds, there's a collapse. And... But that's too fast for us to recognize, but, but if, then you, we bring in the interference to give the B frequencies, so we have epochs that are much slower. I mean, so normally entanglement is induced by, I mean, it's like you know, something, some common source of interaction. Yeah. And what would that be in this case? Well, you can do it with a laser, or I asked Roger this once, he says, well, the natural tendency for things is to be entangled. The question is, why, why aren't they entangled? And he has this thing about quanglement. So the natural tendency, but if, but if you if you want to make a entanglement system, you have two systems and you hit them both with the same laser and they become entangled, something like that. The microtubes are acting a little bit like lasers, is according to what Froelich said, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. All right, uh, we will let the audience free, but feel free to chat with uh, Stuart now and play around with this ultrasound device. Uh, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Predicting that uh, that there's no uh, consciousness in cerebellum because it's modular or something like that, but there's no pyramidal neurons in cerebellum. So if you say, well, consciousness primarily happens in uh, pyramidal neurons, then that explains that. End integration and cortical pyramidal neurons are the most likely site for consciousness from the previous uh, summary slide. And microtubules in the pyramidal neurons are the most likely source of Hodgkin-Huxley deviation from several slides before. Therefore. Microtubules and pyramidal dendrites soma are the most likely site for consciousness. So uh, there they are again. And uh, I want to make this point that if you, if you record from uh, a single pyramidal cell, and Christoph Koch did this work, from the, the soma and the apical dendrite at the same time, there's this perfect correlation, despite this being uh, quite far away, 50 microns. Is that right? Uh, 50 microns away, they're perfectly correlated. And uh, this can't happen by membrane propagation. And in the paper they say well, it's because the, the noise and the, the background noise is, is coherent, is, is perfectly synchronized. But then what's synchronizing that? I don't think that's a really good explanation. I think it could be coming from inside, but we don't really know. The point is that there's this isopotentiality in these cortical neurons. And they don't like to talk about this anymore. It's like an embarrassment. So the final point about this is that the being consciousness might ex extend from here through these through inner neurons and basilar dendrites uh, in this layer, and perhaps uh, even even up to the cortical surface, since there's isopotentiality and other neurons. Okay, so what about microtubules? Now the party line is that they are the structural support; they're the skeleton of the cell. 
and they provide transport. So here we have a, a neuron. This is from this paper here in Science a few years ago. And this is the axon here, and this is a dendrite, because you see it's going to branch. So let's say uh, you're synthesizing something in the cell body that has to go to this synapse out here. How does it get there? Well, it's carried by these things called kinesin going this way, and then dynein going that way. And uh, whatever the cargo is needs to be delivered to a certain synapse, whether it's here, 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 or wherever. And that means that it has to jump from one microtubule to, an to another, because remember the dendritic microtubules are interrupted and, and uh, <coughs> mixed polarity. So it has to jump from one to another, and then it's going to come to this branch point. It's got to go, do I go right and do I, or do I go left? So how do the motor proteins know where to deliver their target? It, you know, imagine FedEx or something like that. How, how, what's their, what's their uh, addressing system? Well, it turns out that tau protein, shown here in the red, which is a microtubule-associated protein, which is the protein that gets dislodged and hyperphosphorylated in Alzheimer's disease, is the traffic signal and tells the kinesin when to jump off and deliver its cargo. So the tau location on the microtubule is like traffic signals or instructions. So how does the tau know where to go and, and you know, what to tell the, the kinesin? Well, the tau is binding at certain sites on the microtubule. So my argument is that the information is embedded in the microtubule that causes tau to bind on, at certain locations, and that's the coding for delivery of synaptic uh, precursors for memory. And we know that if tau falls off, uh, we get Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, uh, you know, all the beta amyloid outside the neuron gets all the attention and the money, but the real problem of the neurofibrillary tangles due to hyperphosphorylated tau and destabilized microtubules inside the neuron. The beta amyloid plaques by themselves don't really cause any problems unless they really invade the synapse, and even that's questionable. The problem comes from the um, uh, uh, what's happening inside the neural, the cognitive deficit. The exact same thing happens in uh, something called postoperative cognitive dysfunction uh, in, in anesthesia. If you have too many anesthetics, uh, cognition doesn't quite come back. It sometimes takes a long time. Sometimes it never comes back. Maybe we're unmasking Alzheimer's, or, but, it, but it looks like uh, anesthetics, uh, pr uh, serial uh, exposures to anesthetics destabilize microtubules and cause this tauopathy. So it's the same disease, pretty much. So what about memory? I mean, we still don't know how memory works uh, because the membrane proteins, these things, are transient and interrupted, being recycled by those, by those kinenes and, and, and kinesins, um, uh, dynenes and kinesins. So one of the things that happens in memory when is calcium comes in and activates this, cam K, this calcium calmodulin, forming calcium calmodulin kinase 2, this hexagonal uh, snowflake shaped molecule which then latches onto microtubules and uh, uh, distributes rapidly throughout the local network uh, of microtubules in multiple neurons and you can see that with immunofluorescence. Now CAMK2, I might have talked about this last time, but CAMK2 is, uh, you start with calcium cal calmodulin, calcium comes in, so this is looking at it from the top, this is looking at it from the side, and it, it sprouts into this uh, snow, this uh, Nano robot, or whatever you want to call it, I'm not even sure, with six legs, six kinase domains downward and six kinase domains upward. And here we see the kinase domains on the inner part of the feet, or hands, or whatever you want to call them. And these things phosphorylate something. And whatever they phosphorylate, since they're, they're, they're being flooded into the uh, synapse, uh, from the synapse into the uh, postsynaptic area, uh, dendrite or soma, uh, whatever they, they phosphorylate is. Um, so uh, I've been, uh, I'm taking the summer off writing a book about uh, uh, consciousness in the brain, and uh, uh, this is kind of what, what the book is oriented on. And I gave Gautam uh, three titles, uh, all of which are potential candidates for the book title, and he picked this one because it's the safest. Now the one I prefer is this one, Tuning the Brain, How Neuroscience Got It Wrong and Quantum Vibrations Make You Feel All Right. And uh, he said, no, the neuroscientists won't come. They'll be offended, but you're here anyway already. So uh, I think neuroscience got it wrong, has gotten it wrong in terms of understanding how the brain produces consciousness in a lot of, a lot of things. I mean, obviously, we know an enormous amount of details. We know a lot. But how does, how does the brain really work? I don't think we really know.
So uh, part of the, the, uh, the dogma of, uh, of how the brain works comes from, or is summarized in a paper by Crick and Koch in 2003, A Framework for Consciousness. And this kind of, uh, you know, consciousness had been kind of buried, uh, wasn't really talked about. And uh, Crick and some other prominent people, Penrose Edelman, came out in the late 1980s and started talking about consciousness. And uh, anyway, uh, Crick teamed up with Christoph Koch, uh, a, a, a very notable neuroscientist, and they came up with a framework for consciousness. It kind of set the, the, uh, the, the frame or the stage for what we should be looking for in terms of understanding consciousness. And they gave ten rules, kind of like the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm, being, uh, I'm joking, obviously. But um, the, the, the major point they made was that the cortex is the primary site of consciousness, which is probably true. The front, look, the front of the brain looks at the back of the brain, which is also sort of true. We have zombie modes of non-conscious autopilot activities that go on without us being conscious, which is true. Consciousness is, involves coalitions or assemblies of neurons, which is basically true. It goes back to Hebbian assemblies. Uh, there are explicit representations, for example, in V1. I think that's true. Uh, higher levels get activated first, and then consciousness happens later, and that's probably also true. There's modulation of firings, which is probably true, although I don't think firings are what mediate consciousness, and I'll get to that point. Snapshot moments, that is, consciousness is a sequence of discrete events, and I think that's true, and that's probably the most <coughs> profound thing that, that came out of this, because everything else was kind of already known. Uh, there's a, a tension and binding are problems, and there's a penumbra of non-conscious that kind of tied it to William James and so forth. But always talking about, about firings. Now since that time, since uh, uh, Francis Crick passed away, uh, Christoph has uh, aligned himself with Giulio Tononi, so I'd add three more commandments, if you will, that, that consciousness involves integration uh, of, of information and, com and f complexity that phi uh, terms... Um, uh, the Tononi terms phi, complexity, and, and lately uh, Christoph has resorted to panpsychism. I think he realized that the computational approach uh, didn't work and explain consciousness and now becomes somewhat of a panpsychist in his recent book, uh, uh, Confessions of a Romantic uh, Reductionist. I'm not picking on Christoph, I like him a lot. I just think he's, he kind of symbolizes where we've gone and he is one of the leaders and I think, um, I think we're, we're missing the boat. I think we're barking up a lot of, a lot of wrong trees. Okay, so the dogma as it stands, if you distill all that and, and, and take where we are now, I think uh, this is probably what, what people talk about or is taught. Everything's based on the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, that it's integrate, integrate and fire. So inputs integrate to a threshold, then fire. And people look at the firings, the spikes, and their synaptic transmissions as fundamental information bits. Despite the fact that local field potentials in EEG come from dendrites and soma, not from spikes. And, and local field, EEG is the best marker we have of uh, correlative consciousness, despite the fact that, that the emphasis is on spikes, because they're easy to measure. You can put them on, on sound and you hear that kind of stuff, and it's really cool. But consciousness may have, may have already happened by the time the neuron fires. I think it happens, in de which I'll get to, in the dendrites and soma. Um, everything is based on the neuronal surface membrane potentials, uh, mediating signaling, uh, uh, gated, graded potentials on the, on the uh, in dendrites and soma, and the all or none action potential, EPSPs, IPSPs, and spikes. That is everything in terms of information processing, in terms of real-time real cognition and con consciousness in the, in, the, in the dogma. Psychoactive drugs, anything that affects the brain, mood, consciousness, act exclusively at postsynaptic membrane receptors or channels. 5-HT, GABA receptors, dopamine, opiate, NMDA, et cetera, et cetera. Everything, all the drug studies are aimed at, at what receptors being activated. And I, don't, I, think that, I think they do bind to receptors, but they also bind inside the cell, I'll, as I'll show you. And that the neuronal interior, including the micro, cytoskeletal microtubules, provide only structural logistical support. Uh, they're, they're skeletal structures and, the, and transport structures. Okay, so that's kind of the summary of the dogma, that we, where we are right now. Now, what does this not explain? What neuroscience dogma cannot explain? Well, consciousness, awareness, phenomenal experience, the hard problem. Okay, maybe I'm being picky, because you can say, well, nobody can explain that. Maybe that but I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. I think that, you know, barking up the wrong tree, for sure we can't explain it. Memory. Uh, synaptic plasticity supposedly mediates memory, but membrane proteins which mediate synaptic plasticity are transient, hours to days, and they're gone. They're recycled. Yet memories can last lifetimes.
Uh, Real-time conscious control as measurable brain activity correlating with consciousness apparently occurs too, too late. So it uh, must be epiphenomenal and illusory, and I think uh, that's not necessarily true. Uh, Single-cell organisms with no synapses, just one organism, swim, learn, and have sex without synaptic con connections using their microtubules. If a paramecium is that clever, are neurons just you know, on-off states, one or zero? Uh, mechanism of action for anesthetics and psychoactive drugs. Is, uh, you know, people say this receptor, that receptor, but we don't really know. Treatments for Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injury, etc. We don't really have any good treatments. Every, every paper comes out and says this is going to help treat Alzheimer's, and of course they never do. Uh, and the possibility for non-locality, near-death experience, out-of-body experience, telepathy, these things are just say, no, that's impossible because the brain is a computer, blah, blah, blah. Well, how do we really know? There's certainly a lot of reports and uh, this sort of thing of consciousness uh, leaving the body. And uh, the same, you know, I, I don't... Um, I don't claim any proof of any of this, but there's certainly a lot of reports. And the only reason we say it's impossible is because we have this dogmatic approach to the brain, which doesn't really explain anything uh, important that I can tell, important in terms of consciousness. Uh, so we can't really say that there aren't these experiences. Okay, so the basis for the dogma is based on the, uh, on the integrate and fire uh, Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, where inputs come into dendrites and soma, the cell body, uh, from all these synapses all over here. Uh, it's integrated to a threshold, which when threshold is meet, uh, fires. And, and the signaling is by ion ch ions traversing, causing signals along. And then that goes all or none, all the way to the next layer of synapses, with about an 85% uh, probability of releasing uh, neurotransmitters <coughs> to the next, next synapse. So integrate, fire, integrate, fire, integrate, fire. Uh, that's the basic model that we have for Hodgkin-Huxley neurons. You put all these together, and you have the brain as a computer. If you take enough integrate and fire neurons, put them together, uh, you can make a computer out of something that looks like a computational system. And that's the model. That's what everybody's bought into. The brain is a computer. Neurons, uh, firings are bits. Integrate and fire neurons. However, uh, a, couple, a couple problems. Number one, uh, neurons aren't really Hodgkin-Huxley uh, integrate and fire neurons completely. So, um, for example, here's a mod this is from a paper by Nondorf et al. in 2006 in Nature, where here is uh, what would be predicted uh, by the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron with the red being spikes and the gray being activity in the soma and dendrites. And basically, when it reaches a, a threshold about here, uh, there's a very narrow uh, threshold and the spikes uh, occur at, at, at an angle. And the reason is supposedly that... Um, that they have to propagate along these ion channels in the axon initiation segment. That's why, the, that's why they're slanted. And, but there's a very narrow threshold. So when you reach the threshold, you fire, and that's a 1 as opposed to a 0. That's, that's what uh, Hodgkin-Huxley behavior is predicted to be. However, uh, Nondorf et al. put electrodes in, in uh, cortical neurons in awake animals, and what they found was, was, was different. What they found was that the threshold was, was quite variable and also upright. So all the spikes happened, you know, vertically at the same time, which means that these ion channels must have opened simultaneously, some kind of coherent opening. That's for the verticality. But most significantly, we have this very wide variability. Something other than the membrane potential is, is triggering the neuron to spike. There's some X factor. Yeah? What's on the Y axis? Uh, voltage, I think. Yeah, microvolts. These are the spikes, and this is the uh, EPSP, IPSPs. It's, it's the time on the, along the bottom, right? Uh, this is memory potential. Yeah. That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure, actually. With the, with the grouping of the vertical lines, that, that corresponds to um, cotemporal firing. Is that what you're saying of a bunch of it, it happens at, at different voltages. It can happen down here at uh, whatever that is, 60. It can happen at 54. And, and it, it varies from spike to spike. That was the, the point of the paper. There's some additional factor, in addition to memory potential, that triggers a spike or not. Something coming from where? From, I would say, inside the neuron that doesn't, doesn't show in the membrane potential. So at a given memory potential, the neuron should fire. This shows that at a given memory potential, it may or may not fire, depending on some other factor. There's a lot more variability. And they, and they also did it in slice, and they did it in simulation, and they didn't see this variability. So it had something to do with this neuron being in an awake animal.
Uh, I think, yeah, these are individual spikes. Uh, yeah, that's. I, I'm not sure actually. There's the pay. We can we can look it up, or I can look it up. Can I ask you that? What, what did you what are you referring to when you said those channels opened at the same time? Well, um, the the Hodgkin Huxley. The reason these are supposed to be, it's slanted is that this opens and this opens and this opens and this opens. So it's a, it's gradual. But what actually happens is it looks like they're all opening or a bunch of them are opening at the same time. Some kind of quantum coherence, maybe, which has been which has been suggested for that. All right. So what, there's some additional factor. So if we put in a schematic, basically what it says, if we have integration over time uh, versus memory potential, there's a very narrow temporal window and a very narrow voltage window for uh, firing. But what is actually observed is that there's a very wide temporal variability and a very wide voltage variability that influences when there's firing. And what I'm suggesting is this is where consciousness comes in. When I say bing, that supposedly means consciousness. So this, is the, this would be the strategic place for consciousness to come in and affect firing. Otherwise, we're in a deterministic loop. Everything is algorithmic. And well, besides no free will, there's, there's no, we'd be automata. But if there's variability, this is where it would come in and strategically and logically exert, uh, affect behavior and activity uh, by altering the threshold from, in, from, from somewhere. I'm saying inside the cell. Okay, so a couple of uh, uh, preliminary conclusions. Consciousness occurs in end integration, and with that I, I agree with Tononi, except then they bring in spikes, which integration has already happened. Consciousness causes deviation in Hodgkin-Huxley neuronal behavior. I think that's where we should be looking for consciousness. Where and how. Okay, so let's just consider uh, sensory uh, um, uh, inputs. Uh, which uh, go uh, visual or whatever go to thalamus, and we know that there's basically three waves of activity for at least for visual um, visual consciousness. The first wave, primary, goes to V1, uh, as as Coke and Chris, uh, Crick and Koch said, which is not conscious but may have a, a representation. And then there's a uh, a secondary wave uh, feedback, which goes to the front of the front of the brain, prefrontal cortex, or some other area. And then there's a third wave that goes from there somewhere else, various places, and that's conscious. Uh, we know that from, from a number of, of types of studies. So in philosophy, this is similar to the higher order thought theory, Rosenthal and Genera, that you need some kind of executive cortex feeding back to cause consciousness to happen. Now, we were just talking earlier about that uh, study by Ralphie Malik where they watched a movie and there wasn't any, any frontal activity. It was all uh, back. So... This is, uh, this is for this particular type of consciousness. It, maybe you don't need this for everything, but for this particular uh, uh, form, it seems to work. Another reason it seems to work is that um, this third way of frontal parietal feedback, uh, well, Victor Lame has uh, done, he, he's the one who suggested it's the, uh, the recurrence or the, uh, I'm sorry, this is feed forward and then this is feedback. So the feedback uh, feed forward is not conscious. The feedback or the third wave is what correlates with consciousness, and that's what uh, Victor Lame and others have said. Now, also uh, George Mashur, who spoke at the Tucson conference, uh, did an, a very interesting study. It turns out that all anesthetics, whether it's gas anesthetics, ketamine, propofol, the three basic types, the gases, propofol, and ketamine, all act only on this third wave. It, it doesn't affect this. We get nice evoked potentials under anesthesia. It doesn't affect uh, the feedback, the f feed forward. It does inhibit this feedback, this third wave. And why that is is really strange because the, the, the neurotransmitters, the receptors, are all, they're all the same for all three waves. But something sp specific about the third wave that seems to be uh, relevant to consciousness. So <clears throat> the third wave, what happens when it, when it gets to cortex and there's, there's also three waves. Uh, the, the primary inputs come to layer four, and they travel along layer four. And layer four sends inputs, this is supposed to be green, yellow, and red, it kind of looks the same. From four goes to one, two, and six. One, two, and six. And then from one, two, and six, we get this third wave that goes to the pyramidal neurons in layer five. 
the giant pyramidal neurons of layer 5, whose apical dendrites go to the uh, cortical surface and give rise to EEG. So we have this third wave also at the level of cortex. And this seems to be where consciousness is, like, is most likely to happen. I'm not saying it happens only in pyramidal cells, but if it happens anywhere in the brain, and it must, it's got, it should involve pyramidal neurons. It could involve others. Now, if we look inside a, a pyramidal neuron, which is the origin of EEG, we see microtubules. And uh, here's the basilar dendrites, which, which are much bigger, and they go out, and the apical dendrites go to the surface. And here's the axon going down here. And uh, we see that the microtubules in, uh, are, are here. And in dendrites and soma, which, is, which this is, they are interrupted in a mixed polarity. Microtubules can point one way or the other way. And in this situation, they're mixed. They're up and down, mixed together, and interconnected by these networks. So what I'm saying is that this is the most likely place for consciousness to occur in these mixed uh, polarity networks of microtubules in pyramidal uh, soma and dendrites uh, in layer 5. Now, it could happen elsewhere, but if it's going to happen anywhere, it's going to happen there. And there's Bing. Is that, is that, is that beige part down the bottom? Is that, is that the, um, this is the axon. The that's the axon. A axon initiation segment, axon hillock. Yeah, it'd be there. This is an art artistic inter interpretation to make it look nice, but yeah. This, this is the axon. This is the axon hillock or axon initiation segment, they call it now. So, so is the Bing right above that? Or that? I'm, say, I'm saying Bing, Bing is a collective effect, yeah. And also probably out here through microtubules there to other, to other neurons. And here we see the structure of the microtubule come back to that. So... Um, yeah. Now, f a couple points. First of all, there's no pyramidal neurons in the cerebellum. Uh, Tononi makes a big deal about his phi complexity model. A good candidate to store memory, because then they're going to get recycled. So what could these things phosphorylate that would make sense in terms of running the show, in terms of organizing things and, and encoding memory? Well, we published this in uh, 2012 that uh, micro the, the uh, geometry and size scale of the CAMK2 perfectly matches the microtubule hexagonal lattice. And we also showed in the paper that the uh, phosphorylation gets down to the specific amino acids in the tubulin that can, that can be changed and alter, and alter uh, the state of the tubulin and encode information to bind, bind tau or to do whatever, to, to affect vibrations as we'll get to. So it could be I, that, mic that memory is encoded in microtubules. Um, I think it's really the best bet, because membrane uh, proteins don't last long enough. Neurofilaments are possible. Uh, they're very long-lasting. But at least for short-term or medium-term memory encoding, uh, microtubules, I think, are the most logical candidate. And here is we show the uh, capacity for information storage, uh, depending on the A lattice, B lattice. U humongous amount of information capacity in just one little neighborhood of, on a microtubule. So this is where memory could be. Which leads to the general uh, topic of information processing in microtubules, which I uh, first published on in 1982, wrote a book about in 1987, and uh, then started applying Froehlich coherence and working with physicists like Steen Rasmussen, looking at uh, quantum coherence, or not quantum, but coherence of microtubules processing information like microtubule automata. So the idea is that there's the synapse coming in. This is acting, and here's the microtubules. Notice how different they are in the dendrite uh, than in the axon, where they're continuous and unipolar. So the, I'm saying the information uh, memory gets stored here, and processing goes on here, which, which then initiate, uh, influences uh, firing here. In other words, why, why are we paying attention only to the membrane instead of looking at what's inside? In medicine, it'd be like looking at dermatology instead of all of medicine, just looking at the, at the surface. Okay, so another factor about this is where do psychoactive drugs act to alter consciousness? Um, <clears throat> most people would say, you know, for example, fi uh, serotonin receptors, 5-HT receptors, the uh, SSRIs, the antidepressants, they have this effect on the membrane, inhibiting reuptake of serotonin immediately, and yet it takes several weeks for the antidepressant effect to kick in because um, the microtubule cytoskeleton needs to reorganize. And I'll give you a reference for that later. Uh, GABA receptors are thought to mediate effects of benzodiazepines and anesthetics. I'll come to anesthetics later, but benzodiazepines actually don't really bind to GABA receptors. 
they alter slightly the binding of GABA to GABA receptors. The point is that all of these drugs are nonpolar and they're going to get into the cell and they're going to bind to microtubules also, in addition to anything they're, they're binding to at the, at the membrane surface, including opiates, opioids. Now, as far as uh, uh, well, NMDA we'll come back to. So um, I'll just take these individuals. I kind of said this before, but membrane effect immediate, but antidepressant effect takes weeks as cytoskeletal microtubules reorganize. There's the reference. Um, GABA, they don't bind. They just alter the binding of GABA to the GABA receptor. And anyway, the, here's a GABA receptor, and here's the microtubules. So it's kind of like the GABA receptor is the tip of the iceberg of the microtubules anyway. So it's literally uh, one big system. Uh, NMDA receptors, ketamine. Uh, everybody's always wondered about how ketamine can, can do something to the NMDA receptor and yet uh, and be an anesthetic and yet cause uh, dissociation and, and hallucinations and people floating on the ceiling and, and then they come back and they're perfectly fine. It's a great drug in anesthesia, by the way. And uh, uh, it turns out they also bind to uh, microtubules. This is from uh, studies looking for ketamine toxicity because it causes postoperative cognitive dysfunction. And uh, it, it induces tau hyperphosphorylation in, uh, that's a microtubule. It's kind of hard to see. It's kind of dark. But, but uh, trust me, that's a microtubule. And it's all messed up uh, if you give too much ketamine. So ketamine binds, binds to microtubules as well as an NMDA receptor. Okay, now anesthetics. I'm an anesthesiologist. I make my living uh, passing gas, as it, as it were, putting people to sleep, waking them up. I've been doing it almost 40 years. And in my field, we still don't really know how anesthetics work, although it's looking like they're acting on microtubules, which is what you would want if you have a theory of consciousness based on microtubules. And they spare non-conscious functions. We do evoke potentials during anesthesia. The patient's unconscious, but their brain is receiving inputs. So where do anesthetics work? Well, going back over 100 years ago, these two guys, Meyer and Overton, showed that the potency of a bunch of gases, which are anesthetics, and they looked at different animals, mice, writing reflex, you know, what concentration they would, they would get back up and, 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 and get off their back, and, and, uh, and tadpoles, when they would start to swim, all different animals, and they got the MAC, the, essentially the ED50, the mean alveolar concentration, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the potency of the drug, and look for, look for a whole bunch of physical parameters of what they uh, would correlate, what the potency would correlate with, and they found that the co potency over many, many orders of magnitude correlated with solubility in olive oil, of all things, gas partition coefficient. So methoxyfluorine is the most potent anesthetic. You only need 0.25%, uh, uh, halothane 0.75%, and then just go up and up, nitrogen in many, many atmospheres. But it all correlates perfectly perfectly over many orders of magnitude with solubility in olive oil. Now what that means is if you 